Welcome to the WRL Daily Download. I'm Jack Hagel. There's a fight brewing between disabled rights advocates and the state. They're at odds over the best way to help people with disabilities. The people who are affected are also in disagreement. The fight has spilled into the state legislature and hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake. WRL state government reporter Travis Fain dove deep into the debate and he joins us now. Travis, good to see you. Hello. Travis, this is a really complicated debate, and in your recent article, you did a really good job of sort of breaking it down. Could you do your best on summing it up for us here? Yeah, I mean, it all kind of comes down to, I mean, think about how complicated your life is and how different it is from other people's lives. Now imagine you have one of a wide range of disabilities, uh, some of them significant enough to where uh, you can't go to the bathroom on your own, but I mean, you, you... you can have a job. You can work from home. You can have, uh, in some ways, I mean, you don't have to necessarily live in an institution. And years and years ago, decades ago, there was a decision called the Olmstead decision at the United States Supreme Court that basically said, if a person with disabilities can live at home, can live and work in the community, then the state has to enable that as opposed to putting them up in an institution and, I mean, almost warehousing people, right? And, and so- there's this continuum of we have some large institutions where people live. We have some group homes where maybe six people live uh, with varying disabilities and then someone lives there with them to help them. And then people who live at home on something called a, an, an innovation waiver, you might hear it called an IDDD waiver, intellectual disability, uh, developmental disability waiver. And that's money. It's like 80 grand a year that helps you hire someone. So uh, that your family helps you, but also someone comes in and helps you. And, and the whole, the consternation here is, well, how much money for this? How much money for that? How much money for that? Are we doing a good enough job in North Carolina of giving people the options they have to live the best life that they can? And a group called Disability Rights North Carolina, which is a watchdog, says, no, absolutely, we're not. We are, we are pushing people into group homes, uh, and we are not – funding these other programs to the extent we we should. And so that's why th- th- there have been a number of uh, major, major lawsuits. So the outcome of this clearly could affect how many people with disabilities live. There's obviously some debate in that community as well. Yeah. So uh, one of the things I've heard from people, for, from parents particularly, and when I say parents, I don't mean parents of a young child. I mean parents of someone who may be in their 30s and is significantly disabled and their parents are getting into their 70s. Uh, and thinking about, well, what happens to my child after I die? Uh, or maybe the parents have multiple children and they don't feel like they can take care of a child with significant disabilities just day and night, which is what it takes sometimes. And so they've put their kid into a group home and they're happy with it. They say, you know, my child is happy there or or my child goes to uh, what's called a congregate work. Think of a workshop, OK, where you, you do kind of it's kind of a menial job, but you're in a, a warehouse and you're packaging things and stuff like that. So they're, they're work programs and they're group homes. And the parents say this is important. You know, my my kid enjoys this. And I'm afraid that Disability Rights in North Carolina, by pushing for this this more in-home care, because of the economics of all this, is going to end up shutting down the thing I depend on. And what Disability Rights North Carolina and people with disabilities who I've talked to will say is, we're not trying to shut down good programs. We're trying to force more options so that the person with the disability, if they can make the decision for themselves, has the option. Because if the money's not there, you don't have an option. You end up in a group home or an institution, a congregate work facility, as opposed to having someone help you through your daily life. Maybe you can have a job uh, in the community. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll hear some of the personal experiences of people who could be affected by this battle. Stick around. Welcome back to the WRAL Daily Download. We're talking with WRAL state government reporter Travis Fain about a fight over services for the disabled. Travis, you mentioned that there's a lot of money involved here, and there's a fight at the legislature. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, so so Disability Rights North Carolina, the watchdog I mentioned earlier, they're a protection and adv- advocacy agency. So they're, they're mandated. There's one of these in all states, all 50 states, and they're mandated by the federal government 
to push for rights for disabled people. That's their job. It's it's the only reason they exist. And they're federally funded. They get some private money. They're not really state funded. But the legislature has not woken up to the idea, but become very interested in disability rights in North Carolina because of these lawsuits that could end up costing hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to have to flow. Because it, I mentioned the innovations waiver earlier, which is like 80 grand a year to help people uh, live in their homes, you hire someone to come in. It, there's a waiting list of like 17,000 people that want those things. And I've covered this issue in multiple states. There's always a waiting list. There's never enough money for these what we call innovations waivers. And it, it would obviously be expensive to fund that entire waiting list, which is what disability rights wants done over a number of years. So a bill got filed in the General Assembly recently and then moved forward. It's passed the House. It's waiting action in the Senate. That basically said, all right, disability rights in North Carolina, you can have a big impact on our budget, the state budget. We want you to start reporting things to the legislature. Uh, One of the things they asked for was basically justify the last 10 years of your existence. Tell us, you know, how many people you've helped, how much success it was. We want this disaggregated by different disabilities that people have. So it's a lot of reporting. But that's there's subtext to it. It's not just, hey, we want to read some reports about you. It's an entity that isn't state funded that answers to the federal government, the state legislature saying, we want to talk to you. We want dialogue. We want oversight. And Disability Rights North Carolina sees this as kind of a shot across the bow. Uh, and, and what lawmakers say is we, we want to work with this group, but we got to drag them to the negotiating table because they're too fast to file a lawsuit to try to force what they want to do. We, we, we want fewer lawsuits and more negotiations. And so they're kind of at loggerheads on this because what disability rights will say is, you know, this Olmstead decision we talked about earlier that, that grants people various rights, it's decades old. North Carolina and other states are dragging their feet. So why wouldn't we file lawsuits? And while this goes on, there are people who are waiting on a decision. You spoke with some of those people. What did they tell you? So I talked to a guy named Jonathan D'Angelo that I'll start with, and he's he, he's got a, a, a spinal condition, and you know, he needs help getting dressed. He needs help going to the bathroom. He lives with his parents, though. He, he dates. He is able to. He's got a full time job. He told me, but what he is absolutely terrified of is not. It, it, he's thirty four years old. His situation is going to change, and he worries that one day he's going to end up in a group home or an institution. So he's pushing. He's on Disability Rights North Carolina's side here saying, we have got to do a better job of funding these waivers so that I and others folks in similar situations can stay in our homes. I need help with X, Y, Z, but I can still live my life out of out of a house, out of my regular house, as opposed to having to move into some sort of group setting. Now, on the other side of the issue, I spoke to a number of parents who say group homes uh, have been their lifeline that, I mean, maybe they've got two or three other kids and, 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 you know, helping someone through every aspect of their day because of a severe disability was just breaking their family. They could not do it. Uh, even with some help, they could not do it. So, so they, they put their kid in, in one of these group homes where they're kind of get 24 hour a day care. And a lot of times it's six or fewer. It's only about six people in a group home. Some institutions are larger. And what they say, what they fear is, because the way disability rights lawsuit was going to work was it wasn't going to shut these places down. It was going to shut the front door, as, as, as they say. So sometime in, I believe, 2028, the idea was, all right, you can't take any new admissions. So it's like a phase out. But what people who run the group homes will say is, well, that makes it real hard to plan the business side of this because I have to have a certain amount of staffing. And if I, you know, if, if someone dies or leaves my home and I have six beds but only five people in them, well, when do I fire one of my staffers? You know, wh- when does this not become a viable business that I'm running and do I then have to shut down? And so the concern from the families is that's going to cause this kind of cascading shutdown. Uh, what Disability Rights North Carolina thinks is that these businesses are kind of fear mongering with families and you know, saying, Hey, they're threatening to shut down this program. You like, you better be against this. Uh, and so it's kind of that back and forth, but a lot of the divide seems to be between, uh, people with disabilities, uh, where they can still kind of live 
I, I hesitate to say a normal life because what does that mean? But I think people know what I'm trying to get at there versus people who may have more severe disabilities and their families have put them in group homes. It, it, it's real tough, as one parent told me, to advocate for that full spectrum of experience. I, I want to ask about the logistics of this. Are there enough people in this field to take care of people in their homes? That's one of the big sticking points here because I think the answer, at least the way it's structured now, is no. Uh, the, these jobs, these in-home care jobs, I mean, you can imagine they're hard. You're, you're changing an adult's diaper sometimes. Uh, it, it pays like $13 an hour. And what families and people in the industry have said is we have got to raise that, but we can't afford to raise that because this is primarily funded by the state. Uh, and, you know, the state is only willing to put so much money in this. So, you know, with, with the way wages have gone up for kind of lower level jobs across uh, the economy, you know, if the choice is, well, I can go work at Walmart or I can go work at a fast food restaurant and make about the same money for an easier job, that is kind of sucking people out of this industry. So that's part of what one of the lawsuits, it's called the Samantha R. lawsuit, named after a uh, a young woman with some disabilities in North Carolina. That's one of the things that the lawsuit is seeking is an increase in those salaries and, and, and an increase in the hiring. And then the question then becomes like, where are all these people that we need to hire going to come from? I mean, one, one of the thing, questions I often have with an argument, with a debate like this, and I think this is true of nursing homes, uh, hospitals. I mean, we have a nursing shortage in general in this country and in this state is regardless of how much money you put into it, when do you run out of the people who have the empathy and patience that a job like this takes? Because not everyone can do it, and certainly not everyone is willing to do it. So what happens to these people in the meantime while this is getting sorted out? So it's kind of status quo for now. Um, last year, 2022, we had two major decisions. Like the, the state reached an agreement to close some of these workshops. We haven't talked much about that, but that's like a place you go and do – do the jobs uh, and you make less than minimum wage, but it's something for you to do, a way to you for you to contribute. Uh, and a lot of families say that their their kids enjoy that, their adult kids enjoy that. Um, so that was the, they were going to basically be wound down. That is on hold. Uh, the Samantha R lawsuit. We had a major decision from the judge in November of 2022, who basically said, "Yeah, you got to do what disability rights says. Here's a schedule." That is on hold, too, because the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, so Governor Roy Cooper's administration, appealed, basically saying, this is going to break the current system before the new system is ready. We have got to build capacity uh, with like the waivers and with the workforce that we talked about that would come into people's homes and help. We've got to build that up, and we have a plan to build that up, but it's going to take longer. Uh, we cannot have the risk of closing group homes. And so that's been appealed. And so it's just continuing to work its way uh, through the courts. I, and w one of the things Jonathan D'Angelo, the young man uh, who is disabled, but living at home told me is that when you have a significant disability, everything about your life is a fight. He said that the only reason he was able to go to school in Connecticut, where he, he was from, he is from, uh, the only reason he was not put into a class full of nonverbal kids was a lawsuit. And it, it, if he's calling the insurance company, it's a fight. If he's calling Medicaid, it's a fight. Everything is a fight. So this is this is something that this community is used to, where you just have to scrap, scrap and fight for every little thing that you think will make your life better. So do we know when there's going to be any resolution to this? I think it's probably going to be a while. I mean, lawsuits obviously take a long time. Um, so I don't know exactly. I, I think this is a fight that will probably never end. We'll just see kind of incremental change one way or another. Now, the bill we talked about a little bit where the legislature is trying to get disability rights, North Carolina kind of to the negotiating table more through that reporting system, that has passed the House. It had widespread, I mean, bipartisan support. It's going to sit in the Senate for a little while, though. I don't know what the state Senate is going to do about it. And, I mean, again, ultimately what that bill says is disability rights. You have to do some reporting to it. So it's not – it's more a vehicle for discussing things as opposed to to, to changing things. I, the, the, the history of these issues is that it takes a very long time. Well, we know you'll be watching. Travis, thank you. Thanks for having me. That's WREL state government reporter Travis Fain. 
For his in-depth story on the battle over disabled care in North Carolina, visit nccapital.com. I'm Jack Hagel. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for listening to the WRL Daily Download and for making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WRL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email with triangle news, events, and headlines to help you get ready for the day. Sign up at wrl.com newsletter.